I'll now quickly move on to our young colleague, uh, Priyanka Bide, who is the founder director of the Cubanine Initiative. And you know, in a short span of about three to four years, the Cubanine Initiative has established an amazing footprint, uh, especially in terms of widening the discourse on gender sensitive foreign policy. And they have tried to bridge the discourse on development and foreign policy and raised a whole range of issues in terms of finessing the vocabulary around climate change, around trade, around regional cooperation, around what is known as non-traditional security issues. And I, I think Priyanka is ideally positioned to lead this along with her colleague uh, who couldn't be here with us today. Uh, she was a consultant with the United Nations Non-Governmental Liaison Service in New York and has worked with Saslon Energy, Strategic Foresight Group, and the Institute for Sustainable Com Communities and Dalberg Advisors in Asia. She's currently a visiting faculty at the Nasi Monji Institute of Management, and she's often taught us uh, in our many uh, sort of collaborative initiatives how to be precise, how to, be, how to base our extra extrapolations on hardcore data, and how to analyze data and communicate it uh, simply and clearly. And so over to you, Priyanka. Just like to hear from you about uh, your perspective on how India can contribute towards this vocabulary of, of vocabulary of broadening the terms of reference of what you call feminist foreign policy. You are in a in a minority in India that calls it feminist foreign policy. We all refer to it as gender sensitive foreign policy. So over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, firstly, I must thank uh, IIC Viscom and the U, U delegation to put me on this panel of such remarkable speakers, Ambassador Rao, Ambassador Ganguly, Dr. Gopinath, and Kushi. We, I've always admired you all, but now I have new names uh, to add uh, to my list of women to be admired. Um, so let me begin. You're right. We do refer to it as feminist foreign policy also because we want to actively engage in the global conversation uh, that's going on, which terms it as feminist foreign policy. Um, we do not see a feminist foreign policy as a silver bullet, a magic wand uh, that is going to solve all of the world's problems. Uh, we see it as an approach to mainstream voices, perspectives, and ideas uh, that have traditionally uh, been marginalized in decision making uh, with the hope that they will help us solve current and emerging problems. Um, the way we therefore look at the countries that are on this path, we, very broadly to uh, categorize them, there are countries that have announced feminist foreign policies uh, like um, Spain, Germany, Luxembourg, France, Mexico, Canada, and maybe soon Slovenia. Um, and then there are those that have announced an intent, uh, such as Libya and Chile. Uh, and then there are those that are that, that have strong gender mainstreaming within their po uh, foreign policy making ecosystems, and within that we actually do consider India part of it, um, Argentina, um, Australia, uh, Ireland, and many more. So those are the broad uh, categorizations. We also see how each country uh, that has announced a feminist foreign policy is doing it in a very um, unique way, which is very specific to their uh, lived experiences and their context. So we have Canada that started with a feminist international assistance policy. They do consider uh, gender very strongly within their trade policies, but they don't use the term feminist. Um, we have Germany that started with gender mainstreaming within their federal foreign office and then announced much later a feminist foreign policy. And then a year later, um, you know, guidelines as to what they would mean and will continue to develop it. Um, Sweden has taken, as Dr. Gopinath correctly mentioned, has disassociated from the word feminist, but still uh, there are several structural changes in place um, and they are quite committed uh, to the, uh, the gender mainstreaming and their foreign policy as well. Uh, we also uh, found very interesting how people uh, look at the word feminist, how they look and term uh, inclusive. Uh, Mexico and Spain, for instance, take a much uh, broader uh, perspective to it. And as we know from India's experience, but also from the experience of several countries, that women are not a homogeneous group. Um, so we have to dig much deeper. We have to take an intersectional lens. Even within a common economic strata, there are differences when you look at 
states, when you look at urban and rural, when you look uh, b uh, between castes. Um, so while then looking at the, uh, the Indian story, what uh, we have found encouraging in the recent past, um, is uh, this shift in the national level, in, at the national level, in the narrative from uh, being, from looking at women's development to women-led development, and we um, are very curious to see how um, the government will go down, go along this path and take it forward. Uh, but we do believe that as India, we are very far away from using the term feminist. Uh, it is still um, has a very Western connotation. Uh, it's looked at in the binaries, uh, in the policy circles as well. Um, and it does not translate very easily into many languages. So we've actually, in our, in our report, used the term, I'm going to shamelessly <laughs> promote my work, but the term uh, opp opportunities for a more inclusive foreign policy uh, that we presented with the Conrad Adenauer shift from India office. Um, and uh, this is because as um, we look at uh, things that are going to affect us, climate change, and we look at what it means to be inclusive, uh, we are looking at women, but also larger communities that are marginalized. Uh, when agriculture is affected, of course, it is the large sections of women in the unorganized workforce and then their families. But when a small fishing village uh, is impacted, um, it is women through the, the men that are still very much the people going, into, going uh, to sea and uh, other sort of the, the economic owners. And through them, uh, their families and women are affected. And how do we then create policies that have this wider perspective um, is something uh, that we are trying to look at. Um, the government also is now using uh, more uh, increasingly the word inclusive. We've seen it extensively in the designing of our G20 outlook um, and referenced uh, several times uh, by our Prime Minister, Foreign Secretary, and people at high levels. Um, so that is very encouraging. Um, but one aspect of feminist foreign policy, of course, um, as we have spoken about, uh, is uh, the number of women. The other aspect is uh, the approach and how do we make policies uh, more inclusive. I know I'm running out of time. Um, so I will wrap it up. One thing I wanted to add to what uh, Dr. Gopinath said and Ambassador Rao also said about how the number of women in the services uh, is reducing. We looked at the, at the picture of the incoming batch of IFS officers uh, who would have joined last year and counted, and they were around 44% that were <laughs> women. So what happens, uh, you know, to them? Where do they go? And it was really interesting to hear your uh, experiences and life stories, and would love to chat about that further. Um, but uh, very concisely, uh, what we think needs to happen is for systems to change. Um, and this is then the responsibility of both uh, men and women uh, that are in leadership uh, to ensure that we have systems that are inclusive. And it doesn't matter then um, who is in power, uh, but automatically the position will ensure uh, that uh, there is an inclusivity in, in, in the outlook. And the way we, uh, where we are at, uh, Currently in India, I think that would require a very strong leadership from men and women as well. And I will conclude there. Thanks. Thank you, Priyanka. Flag so many important issues. I think also the, uh, the possibility of collaboration lies in building these institutions and also providing structures. And I think that's where this kind of interaction would help enormously. Thank you.